Hello, welcome to the November Sports Heaven podcast series. My name is Tyler, and I'll be your host this evening. With us today is Joel on the phone. Hi, everyone. And our first topic will be the NBA and the Thunder, specifically with the loss of Kevin Durant and Russell Westbrook in the uh, recent history. Uh, Durant went out at the beginning of the season with a fractured foot, and recently Russell Westbrook left with a broken wrist. So far, there's they've only played five games, but the record the uh, record of the Thunder is one and four. So, Joel, what do you have uh, to say about this issue? Well, I mean, obviously, the loss of Durant and Westbrook is going to mean a decrease in scoring. That's the obvious option. But with that decrease in scoring, the biggest fear is who becomes your primary scorer. When Durant was lost, I mean, the Thunder weren't they weren't thinking all hope is lost because I mean, Westbrook could hopefully keep them above five hundred basketball and keep them going. But now with Westbrook out too, it's really tough to see which person is going to, you know, exactly, like, take over. I think when everyone gives that first look at this team, they think maybe Serge Ibaka is the big guy that can do some damage. You know, because he's a really, he's a pretty good defensive player. But in recent years, his scoring has improved. He, it's only five games, but he's averaging 18 points a game this year. And, I mean, he's, he's obviously, like I said, he's worked out, he's getting a lot tougher down low put up the points on there. His points per game has risen every season for the past four full years. So, I mean, that's that's obviously very impressive right there. Um, while I'm saying that Abak is the first thought, and I don't I don't really know if it's going to work out that way, though, because you look at how the Thunder have gone before they played with shooters. You know, Durant, obviously, an incredible shooter. Westbrook is more of a scorer than a shooter. You know, Westbrook, will, he, can, he can make longer shots, but he also likes to drive a lot. I see Reggie Jackson, the big guy who's going to get all the points. You know, he's he's been in an interesting spot the last couple of years since he's been with the Thunder because he's been kind of, you know, on the bench. He'll come in when Westbrook's out. His playing time is going to shoot up big time now. He's only played in two games so far this year. He's had a couple of injuries in the way for him. But he definitely, I think it's his time to finally do some damage because he, he can score for sure. He, I mean, the, the minutes are just going to come with points. Yeah, Reggie Jackson definitely seems like a good uh, step-up candidate. What do you think about the uh, early season surprise of uh, Perry Jones? He's really uh, scored a lot of points this season so far. Yeah, early he has been really well. He um, got hurt on Tuesday against the Nets, unfortunately. They said it was a knee. He's day-to-day. But so far this year, he's looked you know, pretty solid. He's averaging 15 a game. Granted, that's only five games. But, I mean, that's still – I guess you don't really expect that, I guess, out of a young guy. He had 32 points against the Clippers, a game that they lost and when they lost Westbrook in that game. But, I mean, when you put up 32 points against Doc, a team that Doc Rivers coached, that's, that's pretty good. And then scoring 23 like a couple of nights later against the Nuggets, I mean, it shows he's probably not a fluke. But, I mean, it's, I mean, he's only in his third year, I believe, so it's going to be really tough to see if he can, he can really, like, blossom into a good score. Yeah, it'll be very uh, interesting to see who um, takes takes the scoring away from Durant and Westbrook. Last season, Durant averaged 32 points per game, and Westbrook averaged 20 points per game. So it'll be interesting to see where the 52 points per game uh, come from. And obviously, last year's Thunder scored 106, 106 points per game, so that will most likely drop in uh, Durant and Durant and Westbrook's ap- absence. Absolutely, I see a complete change in the, in the way they even play their game. You know, they get on the run, they get on that fast break, kind of what the old Miami Heat used to do when they had their big three. You know, both those teams, they have always excelled on the fast break and getting the ball in the open court, getting those rebounds and getting down scoring, you know. But without the quicker players like Durant and Westbrook, you may see them working the ball down a little more. I don't see Kendrick Perkins scoring more points, but I see Steven Adams and Serge Ibaka getting more points down low. So I think that's going to be – it's really important to win the boards and then score big – score – big uh, points in the paint. Now, with all of the uh, injuries and the players that might uh, end up stepping up, do you think, think the uh, Thunder can stay afloat, maybe do 500 until December when Westbrook comes back? Oh, boy, I don't know. It's a brutal Western Conference. They, uh, they are not in a really easy... If they were in the Eastern Conference, maybe they could hang around. I don't think this team's... I don't know if they're going to make the playoffs. I think they're going to tank so much in the time that Westbrook and Durant are gone. But there's no, almost no shot they'll make the playoffs. All right, thank you very much for your insight on that, Joel. Uh, next, our next topic will be the uh, MLB free agent market. So yesterday, teams uh, proposed their qualifying offers to uh, some high market free agents. 
recently I did an article on sports7.sportsblogs.com um, lining out the five key free agents on the market this season. I thought Mike Carp, Jason Hamill, Russell Martin, Jed Lowry, and Irvin Santana will make the biggest impact for the amount of money they signed for in the postseason. So, Joel, what do you have any other names out there on the free agent market you're going to be looking at? I mean, of all the names that you mentioned in your in your article that I remember we posted, I liked, I think Russell Martin was without a doubt the biggest name. I know you put him a little higher up, but I definitely see him as one of the biggest names out there. He's drawn a lot of interest from the Cubs, the Blue Jays, and the Dodgers. The Dodgers obviously would love to have him back. Toronto, I mean, they, they're trying to make a jump forward, and I think his veteran leadership could help them. And the Chicago Cubs, they seem like they're a player for everyone. But Martin, obviously, he can hit. He showed that this past season for the Pirates. He was hitting over 290 for a lot of the season when he stayed healthy. And he's obviously a great catcher, bold love candidate this year. But, I mean, he really helped a young rotation in the past two years mature. So it seems like whatever team he's going to go to, he's going to help. And I think that's why people are really excited if the Cubs would sign him with all their younger players that they have. That he can be a definite influence on them, whether they're pitchers or not. But um, besides Martin, I think one of the other real interesting names out there, um, you got to look at the. There's not a, a ton of batters, I think, position players that are real big out there. But I mean, obviously Nelson Cruz is going to get a lot of attention. And is when he signed with the Orioles this past season after being caught for using steroids before, he got a, he got in in a bargain. They only spent a million on a one year deal for him. So you thought, you know, hey, if things don't work out, they can dump him easily. But he led Major League Baseball in home runs, only 40, but still led the league. And he just showed what he can do, steroid free. So I think, boy, you know, the Orioles have got to bring him back, whatever it takes. But the only problem is he is seeking a four-year deal, from what I've read. So I'm not really sure how that's going to work out with the Orioles, because he's getting up there in age. Yeah, I believe, um, I believe uh, Nelson Cruz is definitely going to uh, end up leaving the Orioles with that 40 40- four-year deal, but the Orioles did offer uh, Cruz a, um, a qualifying offer. Do you think that's going to impact his deal at all? Uh, it's going to be interesting, but I'm really not sure. I think it's, it's tough to see. I, I, would, I, think the, I think the Orioles are really hoping they can make something work out, but I mean, four years is going to be a lot for a guy, and he's got to cash in. You know, he has the right to after his big season, so... I don't, I don't know if he's going to – I think he'll go back to the Orioles, but I think it's going to cost them more than they want. All right. So uh, there's a, been a lot of debate on who is the best pitcher on the pitching market right now, James Shields or um, John Lester. Would you like to chime in on that? Uh, I mean, John Lester, without a doubt, is the biggest pitcher, I think, out there right now. Him or Max Scherzer. I mean, again, both of those have a chance. I mean, John Lester, I think he is a complete free agent, but uh, there's a small chance that Max Scherzer might come back to the Tigers. But uh, if James Shields also has a shot at coming back to the Royals because the qualifying offer, I do not think that Shields will be back with the Royals. I do not think Scherzer is going to be back with the Tigers. But um, the most interesting name out there has got to be John Lester because as soon as he left the Red Sox and you saw them retooling with their trades for this coming season, it seemed really likely that they would have a shot to go up after him again. And it looks like they're looking to make a splash in the pitching market. However, I, I don't know if this is going to happen or not, because he, while he had a strong season with the athletics, he, he's going to be demanding more money because of that. So that's definitely up for question. You know, John Lester, a great season once he went to the athletics. He was great when he was with the Red Sox. Wild card game, he blew up. That's, a, that's not going to hurt his stock too much. It was only one game. Besides the Red Sox, the other team that seems real interesting is the Cubs. I mentioned the Cubs are almost into anyone out there. They need, they need some names. And I think they've got a lot of money to do so. They're they can be ready to make a jump the next couple of years. Um, the Yankees were briefly linked to Lester, but it does not seem like the Yankees are willing to spend a lot of money out there this year. They're really hoping to play it safe and keep who they have in their long term deals. Um, as far as as far as Max Scherzer goes, that's um it's a real interesting name because you know he seemingly these past two years he showed he was the Tigers' best pitcher, and they went to him instead of Justin Verlander and Annabelle Sanchez the last two years. You know, Max Scherzer was the guy. And he just missed being an AL Cy Young candidate this year. But he, um, I mean, whoever he goes, he's going to get a lot of money for sure. They're keeping David Price this next year. So I think that's why Scherzer's out. Um, I, like I said, a lot, like the Yankees might not be going big this year. But like always, they've been linked to these big names like Scherzer. 
However, I don't expect him to go there. I think Brian Cashman just got to be signed to his job. I don't think he wants to lose it on like spending too much money on a pitcher. But um, the Cubs, like I said before, they're another real big name. They seem like they want a pitcher more than anything. So I think, I mean, I mean of all the candidates out here, I think Scherzer has a solid shot. But I don't think he'll end up there. Now, if the Yankees do not end up spending a lot of money on free agents, especially free agent pitchers, because the uh, starting pitching rotation is definitely a need for the Yankees, where do you see them upgrading and uh, trying to get uh, I improve? Think, I think if the Yankees are going to spend any money this offseason, it's going to be on David Robertson, their own closer from the past year. Um, and last season was his first as a closer with Mariano Rivera having retired. Robertson showed he was a real deal. I, he can be a closer wherever he goes. Um, near the end of the season, there were just this was just fans, I think, making rumors they hoped would come true. They said Robertson to the Red Sox would make a lot of sense because uh, Koji Uyahara was a free agent this coming season, but the Red Sox have brought him back. But still, like I said, they still have some money, so they might have room for Robertson in there. However, I don't think it's worth committing to two guys that can close like that. You've got to pick one or the other, even if Uyahara is 40 years old. So I think Robertson is not going to the Red Sox. Um, briefly mention about with the Tigers. The Tigers have always had bullpen troubles, and that, that helped them get swept this year by the Royals. But it's going to take a lot for him to go there. I think he's more likely to take less from the Yankees than to leave and go to the Tigers, just based on the Tigers' bullpen troubles. Because, I mean, they've got to go into a complete overhaul if they hope to get him then, I think. So I think he's actually going to return right back to the Yankees. That does make sense for the Yankees to re-sign Robertson after their long track with Mariano Rivera and great closers with the Yankees. Now, there has been a couple rumors that Pablo Sandoval will be going to the Red Sox. And I know the Red Sox and the Yankees both have a little bit of a hole at third base. So do you see a little bit of a bidding war between the Red Sox and the Yankees getting Pablo Sandoval? I don't think the, I don't think the Yankees are going to be interested in Sandoval because they have they had Chase Headley this year. They required him a little before the deadline, and Chase Headley showed I mean, he had a decent season with them, and the Yankees were plummeting near the end of the year anyway. So, I mean, it was hard to rank anyone's performance. I do not see Sandoval going there. Sandoval is a prime example of someone the Yankees cannot have on their team anymore because he is so inadequate defensively at times. You know, I mean, obviously we see Sandoval make some great plays at third base, but overall, he's about an average or to below average third baseman. And as he's getting older, he's losing that step, so he's going to move to first. But a team like the Red Sox would be should be interested in him because he could DH. And I know Dave Ortiz is currently holding that, or I mean, Sandoval could play first. But I I really don't know if the Red Sox will get him if they're looking to go in on some pitchers too. But I think I think it'd be a good move for them to make as long as Ortiz is comfortable playing first occasionally, you know, to switch out there because I mean I'm not sure how Sandoval will do there. But he's definitely he had a really bad hitting season this year at the plate. In the regular season, but once again, like usually just turned it on in the playoffs. So it's gonna be really interesting to see if the Red Sox think that a change to Fenway Park will help. Because being a switch hitter, you know, Fenway Park's dimensions are a lot smaller and so maybe you might see his numbers go up. So I, I say they should take a shot on him, and I wouldn't be surprised if they signed him. Yeah, I don't. I definitely can see the Red Sox signing Pablo Sandoval. It does sound like the Red Sox are going to be spending a lot of money in free agency. They have been linked to both um, Lester and uh, Jamie Sh- James Shields, as you mentioned. They really, they really need that number one starter in the rotation if they're ever, if, if they're going to end up doing something. And then uh, uh, Pablo Sandoval would fit right in with third place with uh, Will Middlebrooks kind of struggling lately. But there's also been rumors that the Red Sox will be trading Uriah Cespedes. Do uh, you have any? insight or anything about that situation? Uh, I don't think it's, I don't, I know I've heard there's some, been some problems with him, with the team. They're saying that coaches don't like him. However, they gave up a lot to get him by trading Lester for him. And it is not a guarantee that Lester's going to come back. Cespedes is, I believe he's under the Red Sox control. So I think it would be wise to at least keep him for this season, see how he does in a full season with the team. If he's going to be putting up the numbers, there's a good chance he'll stay, you know, regardless of his influence, because that's going to change over time, I think. You know, if he's actually that big of a problem as advertised. But I don't see uh, Jonas Cespedes leaving the Red Sox just yet. Very nice, very nice. So, with the with the World Series ending about a week ago, there's been a lot of debate who is the best left-hander in baseball, Madison Bumgarner or uh, Clayton Kershaw. The Dodgers haven't exactly 
done well in the postseason so far. They lost again in the in the um, division series with Clayton Kershaw not putting up very good numbers at all in the p- playoffs. But Clayton Kershaw is about to win his third Cy Young and may even win the NL MVP this season. So who do you think is the best left-hander in baseball? When you ask me, you have to look at Clayton Kershaw's numbers. and You, know, you will find some fantastic regular season numbers. And while that is, I mean, some of the numbers he's put up, he's put up have shown that he's probably one of the, maybe if not the best regular season left-hander of all time, I would say that Madison Bumgarner is currently the best left-hander in baseball all around. It's, it's weird to say that because a few years ago, Bumgarner was the fifth starter in their rotation for the Giants when they won the World Series. But he's slowly gotten better each year. And it's you can't deny the results. Look at him this postseason. Yeah, I mean, I mean, get past you know, his he had the two he had he had two shutouts. I mean, get past that five innings of relief, which was insanely it was just it was just I mean out of this world. You know, you never see something like that anymore from a guy who pitched two days before and pitched the shutout then. But it's just I mean, Bumgarner has three championships that speak for themselves. The World Series MVP. I know Kershaw's never gotten there, but part of that's been his own doing. You know. Like, the, the way I look at it, this is, it's this simple. 11 appearances in the playoffs, Kershaw is a 5-12 ERA. 14 appearances, Bumgarner is a 2-14 ERA. It's, it's, I mean, that should say enough of its own. Bumgarner's come in relief a couple times, so is Kershaw. Most of those starts, most of those appearances have been starts for both of them. Kershaw has pitched past the seventh inning only twice. And Bumgarner did that all six of his starts this, this October. He did have one. Relief appearance, but every time that he started, he got into the seventh. He pitched seven complete innings or four. So I mean, I think that in itself already shows which player is the better big game pitcher and maybe the best lefty overall. But you got to look at Kershaw's uh, uh, regular season this season. He had a tw- he had a twenty one and three record, and then the past in the past four seasons, he had double digit wins in every season. He had a career year with a one seventy one seven seven ERA, and then he has a sub two ERAs in the last two years. He's also thrown six complete games this year while missing a month of the season. He's a sub one whip and he has a 10.8 strikeouts per nine inning and he's on his way to winning his third Cy Young. Those are Christy Matthewson numbers if you ask me. I mean they're, they're really impressive. I mean he's, if you if you took a look at his career and you compared it to someone like Sandy Koufax you could argue that Kershaw's done better. But the problem is he hasn't because he hasn't won a World Series and Koufax was money in the postseason. The best left-hander in baseball has to be the guy that pitches well both in the regular season and the postseason. And Bumgarner's done that like, superbly. His ERA this year, I know it was a 298, much higher in comparison to Kershaw's. But you take a look at some of the smaller things, you know. Like, it, I mean, Kershaw's career ERA is three, is um, 248. Bumgarner's career ERA is only 306. And the same with the whip, you know. Kershaw's is 106, but Bumgarner's slightly back, just not not by much, by 0.07 digits, but 1.13. So my point is, Kershaw's had two um, insane years in a row. With his ERA is below two. Before that, his numbers weren't exactly that far off from where Bumgarner is right now. So I think it's all starting to even out. And honestly, I would take Bumgarner in a big game situation over Kershaw. But you got to consider that... Um the best lefty in baseball has to be someone that can dominate the regular season as well. Madison Bumgartner has not had a 21 season yet. He's not had a Cy Young. He hasn't had a whip under one so far. And his lowest ERA in a season has only been 277. I don't think that's domination at all. <laughs> but, I mean, when we're talking about Clayton Kershaw's regular season, I see what you mean. But, I mean, you, you mentioned the whip. I mean, it's not that far off. The last three seasons, his highest total has been 1.11. You know, that's not very far off from less than one. You want to look at postseason, I mean, <laughs> that's like a whole nother game. I mean, Bumgarner, like I said before in the postseason, 214 ERA, 0.88 win. I mean, Kershaw can't touch that even in a single postseason. I also Kershaw th- just, he hasn't shown up for the big games. That's the problem. It also been a little bit on the Dodgers itself. The uh, Dodgers have never really produced in the postseason re- late, recently, while the uh, Giants have won three of the past five World Series. I mean, the Giants have lost their fair share of games along the way. Though. Look at this season. The, um, they went to seven games against the Royals. I mean, their only easy like, t- task at all in this playoffs was Bumgarner. It's a wild card shutout. 
you know, that was obviously very impressive. But that was the only really easy series they've had. You know, they fought a little bit with the Cardinals, and you know, that was a tough one. The thing is, every time Madison Bumgarner showed up on the mound, they had a chance to win, and they took it. Except for, I had one loss this postseason. You know? It's, I'm, I mean, I'm just saying, it's, it's tough to beat having a guy like Kim out there. You know, he has insane confidence when he pitches. Kershaw seemed to rattle very easily. You know, I know there was a veteran team like the Cardinals that they played. You know, Kershaw's got to suck it up. He's got to get over that stuff. You know, he's been, he's been in the league about as long as Bumgarner. Bumgarner actually has less experience than Kershaw. It's the problems. Bumgarner was raised in the postseason and Kershaw wasn't. Yeah, it all depends on how much you personally put emphasis on the postseason. So it's a, it really depends on each person's uh, view. It's kind of like a Brady-Manning situation where Brady's always perform perform better in the playoffs, but Manning has always had the uh, regular season numbers. Yeah, I, I agree with that in a way. But I mean, you know, it's just an interesting thing to point out that Bumgarner has a save in the postseason that's clinched a World Series title, and yet Kershaw came and pitched a complete game in the postseason. You know? Very, very true. I think this debate will be raging on for the next couple of seasons. Yeah, absolutely. But it's it's really neat to watch. I think this is a, this is something that people are going to talk about next year, especially if these two face off against each other and with that rivalry. Of course. Well, thank you very much for joining me, Joel, and hope to see no you problem. again soon. All right. We'll talk to you later. Thank you all for uh, listening, and have a great day.